morning, everyone. Great to see you here. My name is Adrian. Welcome to church. Uh, welcome to our ongoing saga of heroes of the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, of course, today we are looking at the Queen. So keep your Bible open to Esther. We're going to try and cover the whole book of Esther. There's lot, lots happening in it. So again, we're going to go fast, but it's a great story and uh, super encouraging for us. And uh, I'm sure you'll find it helpful this morning. So why don't we pray and ask God to help us to listen as He speaks to us. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you do speak and thank you that you give us the opportunity to listen together, to learn and grow together, to encourage one another. We pray, Father, that you would open our eyes and hearts and minds to see the truth of who you are, to understand your enormous power and your grace and mercy and that we'd be strengthened to serve you with everything that we have as a result. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the constant themes of the Bible is that God is interested in and invested in the little things. In fact, you might remember a couple of years ago when uh, we had Big Day in in 2019. Couldn't have one last year, unfortunately, with uh, all the congregations all together. Couldn't do it, but we're looking forward to it this year. But a couple of years ago, we looked at the theme of how the Bible says, do not despise the day of small things. Because all through the Bible, God uses small numbers. Like when Gideon raises an army to try and attack the Midianites, and uh, God says, your army's too big, get rid of 22,000 of them. Still too big, get rid of 10,000 of them. And he just has a handful of men, and God gives them victory. Or there's a moment where Jonathan and his shield bearer attack the Philistines, and they win. Jonathan's got a sword, his shield bearer's just got a shield, I'm not sure what he can do, but the two of them, God gives them victory. God uses small people. Like David, when he's a small boy, takes out Goliath. Or like Zacchaeus, who is literally too small to see Jesus, and yet Jesus finds him and changes his life and changes the life of many through him. God uses small gifts. Remember, the, Jesus is at the temple and he notices the widow give two pennies. And he says, she's given more than all the rest of these people because she gave everything she had. Or that boy who gave his lunch. He was there as part of this massive crowd of people there to hear Jesus preach. No one has any food, except his, this boy, his one mum, thought of what needed to happen. He had a hanky and a comb as well, probably. But he, he's willing to share it. And God takes that, Jesus takes that meal and turns it into enough for 5,000 men. And there's 12 basketfuls left over. God uses small moments. And that's what we see in Esther. Because Mordecai happens to be waiting outside the gate when he happens to hear the plot to kill the king. And then later the king happens to not be able to sleep just when Haman is plotting his evil plan. And he just happens to read what Mordecai did. And it's just the moment before Haman walks in. And another way of putting what we're going to see in Esther is that God exalts the humble. God is interested in the little ones and the little things, because God exalts the humble. But it's worth remembering that as God exalts the humble and humbles the exalted, it's not just that being small and insignificant saves you. Now, the Bible is clear, righteousness always comes by faith. Righteousness comes by trusting God, depending on God, acknowledging God. Now, the thing is, that's a whole lot easier to do when you recognize how small and weak and dependent you are. It's when you feel secure in your position, your possessions, your power, your privilege. When you rely on yourself, then you start to think you don't need God. You're tempted to think you can do it on your own. You trust yourself. But it's when you're weak and have nothing, then you trust in God. And that's what we're going to see in Esther. Our story takes place in Susa, which is the capital city of the Persian Empire. And you remember that what was left of God's people, they'd been through a whole bunch of hard times. They were there in the southern kingdom around Jerusalem, 10 northern tribes wiped out, two tribes around Jerusalem. Babylon comes and invades and defeats them because they'd started to trust in Egypt, they'd started to trust in themselves, they'd started to trust everything except God. So Babylon defeats them, takes them into exile. And while they're there, remember the story of Daniel and his friends, they're saved by God and lifted up by God, protected by God. 
who reveals to the Babylonian king that God is the king of kings. But after Nebuchadnezzar dies, and more Babylonian kings come along, Babylon is taken out by the Persian Empire. So Babylon is wiped out, Persia takes over. And that's where we are at the moment. In fact, by this time, many of the Israelites who were in exile have been allowed to return to Jerusalem to try and rebuild the temple, to try and rebuild what they had. But others have stayed behind. So God's people who've been promised the land, they've been promised that God would multiply them, that He would bless them and that through them all the nations would be blessed. Well, actually, here they are. They're scattered all over the place. They're scattered throughout the world. Many of them are away from the land. They're living amongst the people who don't know God and don't fear God. And so it's in this context that Esther, who is an orphan, and her cousin Mordecai, who kind of adopts her and becomes her uncle slash father, really, turn out to be in the right place at the right time for God to save and bless his people in a really surprising way. And it all starts with the Persian king, Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes. Um, He starts looking for a new queen. He got rid of the old one, didn't like her. And in his search for a new queen, we're introduced to Mordecai and Esther. So read chapter 2, verse 5 with me. It says, In the fortress of Susa there was a Jewish man named Mordecai, son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. He had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile. Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Hadassah, that is Esther, because she had no father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. Uh, Notice in all these things, these big events happen to them. They're not volunteering for them. Mordecai was taken into exile in verse 6. He didn't choose to be in this place. Verse 8, the women were gathered to the fortress. Esther doesn't enter a beauty pageant. The king has commanded every woman to present themselves to him. But we also read there that Esther is just like Joseph that we saw last week. Joseph, who kept getting put into situations not of his choosing, but he honoured God and made the most of it. Esther's like that. But also like Joseph, Esther is very good looking. But have a look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 2. Esther did not reveal her ethnicity or her family background because Mordecai had ordered her not to make them known. Don't tell anyone you're Jewish, he says. And the implication is, I think Mordecai is afraid for her welfare. And he is proved right, isn't he, that there are people in the palace. In fact, in the very next chapter, we'll see how evil Haman is. But at the same time, he's not quite right. Because God had called the Jews to himself to be his people, to be a light to the nations to stand out as different, not to blend in, but to be holy and distinct. So Mordecai's trust in God at this point is not as strong as it could be. It's a little bit like Abraham, who'd been promised by God, I will bless you, but in his travels he lies that his wife is his sister because he's afraid that he's going to get in trouble because he's married to this beautiful woman. His son does exactly the same thing, lies that his wife is really his sister. They don't trust God. And sometimes we are tempted to think, aren't we, that things will go better for us if we keep our heads down as Christians and just blend in with society. It's the safe option, isn't it? Don't make a fuss. Don't stand out too much as Christians or as the church. Don't say all the kind of weird things of the Bible. Don't be too strange, whether it's it's with workmates or with neighbours or friends with the sporting team that you're part of, there's this temptation to think it will go better for me if I don't mention I'm a Christian or if I don't really make a big deal of it. But you know what? We have been called, even more than the the, the Jews in the Old Testament, together in Christ, we have been called to be salt and light in the world, 
to stand out like stars in the night sky. We're called to be different. We're called to be known. And anyway, by the end of chapter 2, Esther is chosen to be the queen of Persia after six months of soaking in a bath of perfume and six months of soaking in a bath of cream or whatever it is. And there's an enormous banquet in her honor. The people are happy about it because they have a whole bunch of their tax payments cancelled and the king hands out gifts. So it's a big happy occasion. But a really significant moment happens at the end of chapter 2, verse 21. Mordecai is at the king's gate. He's at the entrance to the palace there every day trying to get a glimpse of Esther and see how she's doing, hear how she's doing. He's just there all the time. And because he's there, he overhears two of the king's guards, two of the king's eunuchs, plotting to kill the king. And so he gets a message to Esther, who gets a message to the king. The king is saved, the guards are wiped out, and the event is recorded, but nothing happens yet. Then in chapter 3, we meet this guy called Haman. Now, Haman is second in charge of the whole empire. And because of his stature, everyone is commanded to bow down to him as he passes along. But Mordecai, there at the main entrance to the palace, refused and would not bow down. Now, we're not told why Mordecai wouldn't bow down. He may have just had a bad back. It doesn't say why he wouldn't do it. But it's pretty similar to in the story of Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego would not bow down when the king had a statue of himself, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, this gold statue built of himself, and ordered everyone to bow down and worship it. And these three men who loved the God of the universe, they refused. In the ancient world, the kings and the rulers would often try to claim themselves status equal to God and ordered people to pray to them and worship them. It's a way of instilling fear and controlling people but Mordecai knows that God commanded his people you shall have no other gods but me you shall not bow down and worship anything no idols nothing in creation in heaven above or earth below don't worship anything other than me and so Mordecai won't bow now Haman is enraged and furious that Mordecai will not bow down Because he is a Jew, we're told. So listen to chapter 3, verse 6. And when he learned of Mordecai's ethnic identity, it seemed repugnant to Haman to do away with Mordecai alone. He planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout Ahasuerus' kingdom. And it seems repugnant to him, offensive to him to only destroy Mordecai. I need to destroy all his people. How evil is that? So he goes to the king and he lies about the Jews. He makes up charges. He twists the truth. He basically bribes the king with 375 tons of silver. And it's a bit like what happens with Jesus before Pilate. That the religious authorities do exactly the same thing. They make up accusations. He doesn't obey your authority. He's a danger. He's a threat. Let me destroy them. In fact, here's some money, Judas. Find us a way to get him. It's exactly the same circumstances. It's not justice. And Haman doesn't say who they are. He just says, oh, a group of people. And he promises an enormous amount of money to the king. I think he knows what motivates the king. Because the king trusts Haman, second in charge, because the king wants absolute power and obedience, of course, anyone who doesn't do what I say, destroy them. But also because the king is too lazy to care about a bunch of people getting killed, he doesn't say, hang on a second, is this right? Is it just? Who are they? Let me investigate this. He doesn't seem to care. And because he doesn't mind the idea of more money, he says, go for it. And this happened in the first month of the year, we're told. And the month that is chosen by casting lots, basically by rolling the dice, the month that's chosen is the 12th. So a decree goes out to the whole empire that in almost a year's time, on the 13th day of the 12th month, people are to annihilate and kill the Jews and take all their possessions. So chapter 3 finishes with this 
horrible moment of the king and Haman sit down to drink while the city of Susa was in confusion. What kind of a commandment is that? But you know what? That's worldly leadership right there, isn't it? Oblivious, self-indulgent, full of pride. Who cares about the people? Now, in chapter 4, Mordecai hears this royal command and he is devastated. He goes into grief and into mourning. He tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth, this, this horrible, painful cloth and ashes. He just kind of he expresses his lament and his pain and the, the brokenness of his heart. And Jews everywhere join him in this mourning and fasting and lamenting. Now, Esther in the palace obviously doesn't know what's happening. Because she's worried about Mordecai when the servants come back and say what's happening. So she sends clothes and say, please put on these clothes. But he refuses and sends back to her a copy of the decree to kill all the Jews. In fact, Mordecai, with that copy, commands her to go before the king and plead with the king for her people. So he sends the servants back with this message saying, do you, oh sorry, actually this is her response. He sends to her, go before the king. She sends back to him a message that says, actually, don't you realize that anyone who approaches the king without being summoned will be put to death? I can't just go before the king. It, it, they'll kill me. It's a little bit like what we saw the first queen, Queen Vashti, kicked out of the palace for, for that insubordination. This would be a risk to Esther's life. That's the message she sends to Mordecai. Mordecai sends her an awesome reply. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 13. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So he says the danger is real and you can't trust being in a palace to stop you from... Palaces aren't going to stop real danger. Hiding won't help. But even if you do nothing... God will provide salvation for his people from another place. See, he knows God's long-term plan is to save and prosper his people. And that even if he gets it wrong or she gets it wrong or something doesn't go right, his confidence is in God. No matter what happens in the immediate term, God's long-term plans are guaranteed. And it's exactly like what happens in Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are uh, condemned for not bowing before the idol. And remember, they are about to be thrown into the furnace. And they say to the king, our God is mighty to save us from this fire. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship another God. They trust God. So Mordecai knows God is in control. And he even says to her, who knows, maybe you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. Right place, right time. God is in control. Then listen to her awesome response in verse 15 of chapter 4. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. Now, I think implied in that fasting, it's interesting it doesn't mention it, but I think implied in that is a humble and mournful calling on God in prayer for assistance in time of great trial. I think prayer is part of what they are doing. So then in chapter 5... Esther puts it all on the line to save her people. She risks her life to intercede for her people, goes before the king to stand before the throne to be an advocate for her people who are under the death penalty. And in God's providence and in God's kindness, God, the one who grants her favor and grace, it works. Because the king is pleased that she has appeared 
and she obtains favor in his eyes. And he offers to do whatever she requests, even half the kingdom. I don't know what it is about ancient kings, but they love to offer half the kingdom all the time. Now, Esther is wise at this point because I think if she'd outright asked the king, could you please go back on one of your laws? Could you change your word, admit you were wrong? It would be embarrassing to him. It wouldn't work. So she simply asks at that point, come to lunch. In fact, why don't you and Haman come to lunch? And so they go out to lunch and they're eating and drinking and the king offers again. He really is pleased with Esther, loves her. Whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you want, half the kingdom, it will be done. And again, Esther is gentle and Esther is humble and she's not demanding. She says, come back for lunch tomorrow and then I'll present my request. And it's not just building the suspense But she realizes what she has to ask is a very big deal and could go wrong. This is a huge risk for her because she's a Jew. So in chapter 5, verse 9, Haman thinks everything is going beautifully for him. He is rich, like seriously rich. He's rich enough to offer 375 tons of silver to the king. He's powerful, second only to the king. He's privileged. Everyone has to bow down to him whenever he walks past. And he was the only one invited to this lunch with the king and the queen. So he is full of pride. He is full of self-confidence. But as he leaves the palace that day and heads home, there is only one thing that completely ruins his awesome day. As he goes home, Mordecai didn't rise or tremble in fear or bow down at his presence. So Haman is filled with rage. It's interesting that the rich and powerful can have almost everything, but it's never enough, is it? They're never satisfied. Everyone is bowing to him. He's got everything. But not that one insignificant guy in the gutter. He has to do it as well. He's not satisfied. And that one little thing actually ruins his whole day. So he goes home, gathers his friends and family for a very strange meeting. Chapter 5, verse 11. Then Haman described for them his glorious wealth and his many sons. He told them all how the king had honored him and promoted him in rank over the other officials and the royal staff. What's more, Haman added, Queen Esther invited no one but me to join the king at the banquet she had prepared. I'm invited again tomorrow to join her with the king. Still, none of this satisfies me since I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate all the time. His wife Zeresh and all his friends told him, have them build a gallows 75 feet tall. Ask the king in the morning to hang Mordecai on it. Then go to the banquet with the king and enjoy yourself. The advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows constructed. That's great advice, isn't it? Well, there's one little thing destroy him, kill him. Don't wait for the 13th day of the 12th month. That's too too far away. Just kill him now. And so we come to chapter 6 and all the pieces are in place. And in one sense, it kind of looks evenly matched. The queen is going to try and persuade the king, but Haman's already got the law written and he's got all the power. And what's going to happen? It looks evenly matched until you realize that God is the main character of this story and the main character of the story of the whole Bible. He's behind the scenes of everything in Esther and he's working everything according to his sovereign will. Because chapter 6 starts in verse 1, that night the king couldn't sleep. That's convenient. So he ordered the book recording daily events to be brought and read which shows he is a very smart man. If you can't get to sleep, get someone to read you the minutes of the last few parish council meetings. (laughs) That's a perfect solution to insomnia. That's what he's got and kind of, okay, the agenda, the meeting I've opened with... But they happened to read the account of how Mordecai had saved the king's life. Again, perfect timing. And the king asks... Whatever was done for that guy. It was a strange time to ask it. He didn't ask it at the time that his life got saved. But he says, "What actually, what do we do for him? And the answer is, nothing. Now have a look at verse 4 and how everything is in the right place at the right time 
as God was arranging his work of salvation. Just a small moment, but actually everything hinges on this. Verse 4, the king asked, well, who's in the court? Now, Haman was just entering the outer court of the palace. To ask the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows, he had prepared for him. The king's attendants answered him, Haman is there, standing in the court. Have him enter, the king ordered. Haman entered, and the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king wants to honour? Haman thought to himself, who is it the king would want to honour more than me? I mean, that is seriously full of pride, isn't it? He is so puffed up. He just assumes. The king hasn't really said anything, but he's like, it must mean me. And so he says, well, actually, this is what I've always wanted. For the man the king wants to honor, have them bring a royal garment that the king himself has worn and a horse that the king himself has ridden, which has a royal crown on its head. Put the garment and the horse under the charge of one of the king's most noble officials. Have them clothe the man the king wants to honor. Parade him on the horse throughout the city square and proclaim before him, this is what is done for the man the king wants to honor. Haman is so full of himself, he's so puffed up with pride, it must be about him because everything is about him. Just like when he gathers his friends and family for a barbecue and tells them stuff they already know like how many sons he has, and how rich he has, and the job he has. They've known that for years. But he needs to tell them over and over again, because everything is about him. And so he says, this is what you should do. And the king says, great idea. Verse 10, Haman, you hurry and do everything you proposed for Mordecai the Jew. Don't leave anything out. How much would that have humiliated Haman right there? The one guy he really hates. The one guy who ruins everything for him. He has to personally treat him with honor. He can never get him to bow down. Now he's got to go clothe him and put him on a special horse with a crown. And he is forced to acknowledge the greatness of him. And so verse 11 and 12, Haman took the garment and the horse. He clothed Mordecai, paraded him through the city square, crying out before him, this is what is done for the man the king wants to honour. I mean, that's humiliating. And that's a reversal, isn't it? The, re the roles have switched. Mordecai was in mourning. Now he's in royal robes on a royal horse. Haman was the greatest, but verse 12 says, he goes home in mourning. The humble and the lowly who trust God are exalted the proud and the great ones who trust themselves are humbled. The kingdom of God turns everything upside down. More accurately, it turns everything right side up. Because in the world, we have everything upside down because of sin and selfishness. Jesus comes to make everything right. And so at the end of chapter 6, Haman's friends have this really interesting line. They say, you cannot win this one. Because Mordecai is Jewish. And I wonder if there's this sense that they know that the indestructible nature of the people of God because he's on their side. But even as they're speaking to him, the king's guards come to escort him quickly to the next feast with Esther, which feels very different now, doesn't it? The day before, he's like, this is amazing. Now he's like, Ugh. And again, the king at the lunch offers her whatever she wants. Esther, I am so pleased with you. I will give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. She's so different to Haman, isn't she? He is full of pride. He is demanding, give me all the stuff. She is humble. And she's reluctant to ask until it's offered repeatedly. And so her request is a pretty simple one. And it's very cleverly put in chapter 7, verse 3. It's, please spare my life. Chapter 7, verse 3, Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your eyes, your majesty, and if the king is pleased, spare my life. This is my request. And spare my people. This is my desire. For my people and I have been sold to destruction, death, and extermination. If we'd been merely sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept silent. Indeed, the trouble wouldn't be worth burdening the king. So she says, here's my request. Please save my life. 
and my people's life. And the king is offended that someone is threatening the life of his beautiful queen, his wise and noble queen. And he demands to know who it is. And Esther straight away says, it's Haman. And Haman stands up terrified. Fair enough. He just stands there, completely terrified. The king is furious. And earlier in the book, he'd had this full-on rage, temper, anger moment. But he goes out here, goes out to the garden, I suspect, to try and calm down, to try and think about what's happening before he does anything. He doesn't want to fly off the handle. He goes out for a walk in the garden. And when he comes back in, he sees Haman all over Esther, begging her for his life. And it doesn't look good when the king comes back in and sees him doing that. Verse 8, he actually says, would he really violate or assault or harm the queen while I'm in the house? And he doesn't have to say anything more. The moment those words left his lips, it says they covered Haman's face. The servants basically totally understand what's going to happen and they lay a burial shroud on Haman's head before he's even died. And how about this for justice? Chapter 7, verse 9. Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, There is a gallows, 75 feet tall, at Haman's house that he made for Mordecai, who gave the report that saved the king. Just interestingly mentioned that there's a gallows. The king said, hang him on it. They hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's anger subsided. It's it's interesting, the word gallows is more literally a pole or a stake. He's probably impaled. 75 foot tall. That's his humiliation. And that's justice, isn't it? And the result of all this is that Mordecai takes Haman's place as second in charge of the empire. Haman takes Mordecai's place up on the tree, up on the pole. Mordecai takes Haman's place there in the palace. And then when it comes to trying to protect the Jews, the king actually hands to Mordecai and Esther, he hands to Mordecai his signet ring, his authority, and he says, you write whatever law you need, but you cannot revoke a law that's already been written. So you can't just say, oh, the king's word is wrong sometimes. Let's get rid of that law. You, have to, you can write a law, but it, has, it can't unwrite one. So they write a new law that says, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews are commanded to gather and organize and defend themselves and destroy anyone who seeks to attack them. And this command goes out to all the empire that the king is actually on the Jews' side, And in fact, many of the ethnic groups, many of the peoples start identifying as Jews. That's interesting, isn't it? The book started with Mordecai feeling the need to hide their heritage. Now, people want to be Jews, to join God's people and experience God's blessing. And then when the day comes, there's fighting, but God gives them victory. And the Jews absolutely smash their enemies. The Jews are saved... The enemies are destroyed, the empire has peace, and justice is done. Because God has exalted the humble and humbled the exalted. Now, very quickly, what does that mean for us today? I have three implications that I want to share super briefly. Firstly, trust the sovereignty of God. This is another example, isn't it? It's a perfect example of how God works in the details of human history of circumstances, to bring about his spectacular plans. We can trust him no matter what is going on in our lives because he assures us personally that he is at work in all those things for the good of those who love him and who've been called by him. That's where we will find comfort and assurance. We might not know the details of how he'll get us there, but we know God has promised, he has guaranteed our blessing, our salvation, our eternal life through Jesus. Trust the sovereignty of God. Secondly, trust God's timing. See, the story of Mordecai in particular, going from ashes in the gutter at the palace gate in chapter 4, verse 1, to then ruling at the right hand of the king, actually reminds us 
of the parable Jesus tells in Luke 16. Do you remember that parable of the rich man and Lazarus? There's a rich man uh, living in a feast, lavishly dressed, lavish food. Lazarus is this beggar outside his gate, poor, starving, covered in sores. He's got nothing. Now, both men die. And Jesus says, well, the rich man goes down into torment in Hades. And Lazarus is carried away to Abraham's side, to joy and to fellowship. Their situation in life is reversed in the next life. And the only thing that can save you, says Jesus, is hearing God's message, trusting God's word, receiving it with faith. Now, the reason I mention this story is because people read Esther and see it as a promise of prosperity. Because look at what happened. They were saved and they, they ended up more powerful and richer at the end of it. And, and they see it as a promise of success and prosperity in this life that we should all experience. Prosperity guaranteed for every Christian. And if you don't have that, if you don't have success, if you don't have riches, if you don't have health and everything you ever wanted, then it's because you're doing Christianity wrong, or you don't have enough faith, or you're not a good enough child of God, you don't have enough Holy Spirit, God has a problem with you, is what they say, which is just so far from the gospel truth in Jesus Christ. But you see, Esther is a beautiful promise to us of prosperity and success and victory and joy and peace. In eternity. See, that this moment of victory and salvation for the Jews is just that. It's a moment. The ultimate reversal of fortune, the ultimate exaltation that we're looking forward to is in the new creation. The Jews here are still in a foreign land as exiles. They're still separated from the fullness of God's promised blessings to Abraham. No matter how nice it was to live in a palace, it was only for a while Esther and Mordecai still died. But Jesus came. So that those who humble themselves before him in trust and dependence will be given ultimate glory in eternity. Will be in God's presence, in God's city, gathered around God's throne in heavenly new creation for eternity. That's our guarantee. So trust God's timing. Thirdly, trust our perfect advocate. I love Esther's quiet and humble yet powerful courage in this story. The way she goes before the king. And in this, she points us to Jesus. Because we have someone who is willing to go before the king of the universe and plead for our lives. We have someone who is willing to put their life on the line and approach the throne of God as our advocate, as our friend, as our counselor, as our representative and mediator. We have someone who will stand before God for us and he will argue our case that we be saved and live forever. And that is Jesus. And it does cost him his life. But he lays it down freely so that we might live. It's a beautiful truth that Esther points us to beautifully. In fact, we're going to hear a song in just a moment that captures this truth before the throne of God above. It says this, before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. There he is, Jesus, forever pleading my case, forever on my side, defending me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Because of Jesus, because of his death, his resurrection, because he is our advocate, then I belong. We belong in heaven. We are at home in the presence of God. No one can tell us to leave. That's where we should be, in the throne room of God for eternity. So why don't we listen to that song now as it's played for us.